Good morning, everyone. Um, someone give me a thumbs up if you could hear me. Okay, uh, in just a moment, we're going to start. Just wanna make sure that uh, our guest speaker is, is on. All right, welcome. Good morning, everyone. Um, I believe uh, Charlie is on. Yes, okay. All right, I'm just going to turn it over to you in just a moment. Uh, as uh, <clears throat> as we uh, begin, we're going to be, uh, people are gonna be joining, entering the room. So you'll uh, forgive the interruptions in my introduction. What happens is a box pops up on the screen and it tells me that uh, we have to let people in. Okay. Um, this morning is a special morning. Um, it's a special morning because we are privileged to have with us uh, an incredible speaker, a dynamic, prolific speaker who, as you see in front of you on the screen, has traveled all around the world and he's known to many of us and to many Jews and, and, and beyond uh, as someone who has inspired meaningful living, inspired Jewish living, uh, and especially want to uh, make note of his new book, Unlocking Greatness, which is great reviews and really is a treasury of some of that, that koach that is uh, Mr. Charlie Harari, uh, really a, a, a super talented uh, man in the world of business, but, uh, but has found a unique niche in turning youth and adults on to Judaism and uh, to being them, their best selves. Um, before I introduce uh, uh, formally, uh, Charlie, I'd like to mention the dedication of this morning's, uh, this morning's talk as part of our ongoing Sunday morning uh, guest lecture I guess. series. Uh, we dedicate this morning's talk in memory of Caleb Penn Mayer, Zichon Levracha, Israel Yehuda, Zal Ben David, Nechemed Dina Sara, uh, and we thank the sponsors, Allison Yoni Bellows, Amy and Dove Carl, Cheryl and Ziggy Carl, Pam and Lady Carl, Sean Katz, Shira and Craig Newlander, Betsy and Howard Shapiro and Sigal and Josh Speicher. Um, really thank you to each of you and tomorrow evening will be the, uh, the yurt site of our, our, our beloved Caleb Zal. Uh, this morning at around 8.32, I received a, a frantic text from, uh, I don't know if it was frantic, I was frantic when I saw it because of the middle of davening from Charlie said, I'm on, it says nobody's in the room. Um, and I think there was a miscommunication, it was probably on my end, that we were in central time and he's I think in New York. So uh, we, had, we had an experience that we were beyond, we were sort of out of time, out of sync. Um, and uh, on a more poignant and deep level, how much we would love if we could turn back the clock and we could be with Caleb again and we could have him in our lives. Um, but uh, the koach of Torah and the koach of a positive Torah message is that it is eternal, according to Chazal, and that it, 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 is beyond, it is beyond the moment. And that every time we speak Torah and do mitzvos in memory of someone, that uh, their neshama has a zuchos, has a merit. And one of the privileges of this era that we're in, the Zoom era, is that we can reach someone beyond time and beyond space. We could be sitting on the other end of the world, and we could hear from someone else, and maybe it's not just the other end of this world, but maybe we could reach into another, another world. And Mirza Hashem, we should know that day, that, day, that sweet day very soon, we could be reunited with Caleb and, uh, and, and, and through the Koach of Torah and Mitzvos, maybe that day will come much, much sooner. I'm now going to uh, turn over the, um, the, both the microphone and the um, and uh, uh, spotlight over to uh, Charlie, 
and I'll ask everyone else to please uh, mute themselves. Uh, Charlie, do you hear us? I do. Do you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Let me just um, let me just stop okay. your share screen. It's good to okay. see you, Ken. All right. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi. I really appreciate this. Um, it's such an honor to be with your community again. In the the Sham of Yisrael, Yehuda ben Davin Chemia Vedina Vedina Sara should have a Elias Nasham and Shemayim. And uh, whatever we speak here today, hopefully, should continue to bring. I'm sure he is in the highest place, anyways, but it should continue, only continue to bring him Nachas and everybody Nachas as well. Um, and Rabbi, it's so good to see you, albeit on Zoom. I had the good fortune of being in your in your house and in your shul when it was the old shul before it was the real shul when it was just in your it was in your dream. You you had seen it before everyone else did, and um, I only got a chance to take a tour, but maybe one day it'll be zochet to see the shul on Shabbos, and hopefully that shul will be joined with other shuls, and we'll do it in Yerushalayim, Yer Kodesh. A special shout out to those who have their videos on. It's just so nice to see some faces. If not, it's all good wherever you are. However you're, however you're tuning in, I'm happy you're here. But I just want to give a special shout out to those who have their videos on, because when you, when you look at black boxes after a while, it becomes uh, a lot. But thank you. We appreciate it. So we're about to enter into um, maybe one of the greatest holidays that is understood but could be more understood. You know, as Americans, we love underdogs. We love underdogs. You, Nate, you, you tell me a sports story. If it begins with they were once the worst team or the guy came from the worst area, any, any type of underdog we love. That's why the whole world was cheering for the Cubs. It wasn't just that it was the Cubs. It was that the whole world wanted the Cubs to win. The, why? Why were we all pumped for Theo Epstein? Because we wanted them to win. That's why, we, that's why, although I am a Yankee fan, everybody hates the Yankees so much, and why we're getting so much joy out of the Patriots, maybe not making the playoffs this year. It's that there's something about underdogs that make us get so excited. If there was ever a holiday that celebrates underdogs, is this one. This is the underdog of underdogs. And if you think through the story of Hanukkah, you'll realize just how powerful that is. So I want to I talk a little bit about what Hanukkah is, the story. The story of Hanukkah doesn't begin with the candles. The candles are like after the credits. The real story of Hanukkah begins so much earlier. Around 332 BCE, a man named Alexander comes to Israel. Alexander the Great was coming through the world because he had a vision. His Rebbe, a man named Aristotle, had brought to this world the idea of humanism, which was this incredible enlightenment that he was going to bring to the world of getting rid of this divine concept. The world is now about the mind and the body. Even if you look through some of the Greek gods, they're really in the form of humans. And Alexander, through rationalism and humanism, went on a quest to rid the world of the divine. And started to conquer lands and to Hellenize them and to enlighten them. And he came through Israel and there's a famous exchange between him and Shimon HaTzadik, where he decided not to necessarily destroy or conquer it physically, but he left behind a couple of pamphlets, a few gymnasiums, a couple of schools in Hellenism to enlighten the Jews to what the next could be to remove themselves of, of God. And that's really when Hanukkah began. And for the next 100, 150 years, what took place in Israel was the beginnings of a civil war. Groups started popping up, Hellenists, Sadducees. And what took place in Israel was Jews fighting Jews over God's presence. And it got to a place where it was so difficult. It was so challenging. There was such tremendous controversy that at the end of this battle internally, then Syrian Greek King Antiochus, who was a descendant of a descendant of Alexander, came to Israel and said, all right, guys, now it's over. I'm not like my great, great, great grandfather, so to speak, Alexander. Judaism's done. In the beginning, we were like playing with you. Now it's over. So if you learn Torah, we're going to kill you. If you're a rabbi, we're going to kill you. 
If you give your kid a bris milah and we find out, we're going to hang the mom, kill the baby, and tie it around her neck. We're not messing. Rosh Chodesh, we're going to kill you. Shabbat, kill you. No more Mr. Nice Guy. As far as I'm concerned, this is over. What do you think happened in Israel during that period of time? It was over. It was checkmate. As it was, the whole country was basically fighting itself. As it was, the amount of people that were serving were getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, when Antiochus shows up with his arrow in his quiver of, if you stay, if you're still one of those that still keep it, you're dead. What, are you going to put your kid on a bus to a school and not know if that day the Greeks walk in and are going to kill all the kids? You're going to give your kid a bris and not know if in a couple of weeks you're walking down the street, they're going to spot check the kid and then kill the family? What, are you joking? You're going to keep Shabbat? And so basically, Judaism was being chokeholded right now. Antiochus was choking Judaism out of the Jews. So if you wanted to stay connected to Judaism in any authentic way, you know what you had to do? You had to run away. You had to live in caves. You had to go into hiding. And that's what families did. They ran to the mountains. They ran to the hills. They stayed in caves. They came out at night. They practiced a little bit. They held their tradition together as much as possible. And one day off a tip from a Hellenist, they found that there was a family of Kohanim with the father being Matis who was in hills in the Modi'in region in Israel. And they go down and they find the family and they bring them out of their caves. And the Greek soldier brings a pig and says, if you shech the pig, I will let you live. And at this point, it's too much. You know, you can only push a Jew so far. At some point, we say enough. You know, I've got, as some of you may or may not know, I come from an interesting background. My, grand, my, my father comes from Syria. My mother comes from Munkach, which is a whole different speech for a different time. I could, my, one set of grandparents spoke Yiddish. One set of grandparents spoke Arabic. I don't know a lot of each, each, each language. I, knew, I know all the food-related words. You know what else a word I know in both languages? Enough. Because one, one grandmother said, Ginnik. And one grandmother said, Chalas. Because at some point, enough. There's only so much a Jew can take before we say enough. And at that moment, the Matisyao and his son said, enough. We're not taking this anymore. And they pushed back. The Greek soldier got killed. And at that point, they realized they were going to fight or they were going to get killed. Now, somehow along the way, <coughs> this turned into like some guerrilla warfare. You ever grow up with the coloring books of like what a Maccabee looks like? You ever have this growing up with like, he's like 6'4", as if there were Jews that were that big, right? 6'4", totally muscular. He's got the skirt on. You know what I'm talking about? The togas, the shoes, the Star of David. You know, you're like, whoa, like they look like Aryan Jews. You know what I'm talking about? You ever see those coloring books with like your color? You're like, these aren't really Jews. But like even today's, if you go look at like today's like Sayeret Makal, they're all 5'4". You know what I'm talking about? Like, but like somehow in like a brief period of time, Matisyao gave birth to like eight guys that can make any high school basketball team but like that's not true they were Kohanim they never fought Kohanim didn't even go to battle they didn't even have swords they used their forks they had no training they had no shot all they knew is that they were not going to take it anymore and they start to do the craziest thing in the history of the Jewish people they go to war against largely the most most well-organized, strongest army at the time, the Greek army with elephants and formations and long spears. That's like a bunch of rabbis. Listen, I love rabbis. I love my rabbi. I go to him for advice. If there's a fight, I'm not calling my rabbi. It's like walking into the colo, taking 10 guys out and being like, listen, let's go up against the Navy SEALs. It's not going to happen. Maybe if we go to sue them, it's possible. Maybe if we try to out-eat them, maybe if we call our moms and try to out-guilt them, it's possible. But you're talking about a bunch of Jews going up against, no way. And it didn't happen for five minutes. The, miracle, the wars of Hanukkah lasted for three years. A bunch of Kohanim got together and waged war against the strongest army at the time for three years. 
and somehow didn't get squashed in the first three minutes, but somehow pushed the army back off the base Hamigdash, came in, went to look for oil. Now remember, the, there's a concept called Tum Hutcher which means if everything is, 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 is tummy, there's a certain heter to do things in a tummy way. We forget this. The menorah is just one of the many things that, the, that took place in the base of Migdash. There was a Mizbeach, there was Ketiris, there was a Shulchan, there was a lot of things that went on every day. Menorah was one of them. And the time that they came in, the whole place was impure. Had the, had, had the Chashmanayim walked in and said, listen, let's wait to get the oil purified, it would have been okay. And by the way, according to my opinions, there wasn't even a menorah. The Greeks had melted the menorah for its gold. They made a makeshift menorah. They didn't have to light the menorah that moment. They didn't have to use the oil, but they wanted to. They were, they were rocking and rolling. I don't know, they were on a roll. They wanted to use the menorah, and they wanted to be machmir. So just in case they were going to use the menorah, they wanted to use the menorah that had the mahadran seal on it. And because they did that, they couldn't find it. And then finally they found it and they lit it for a day and it lasted for eight days. Remember the story? And today's equivalent would be like, imagine as if you leave your house and you forgot to charge your phone and Apple's like, bing, now you're penalized. You know, you have to walk around with a yellow battery all day and it, you don't charge it and it lasts for eight days. That would be a miracle. That's the modern day equivalent of Hanukkah. You're like, whoa, that'd be amazing. Let me ask you a question. If you were on the committee picking a symbol for this holiday, if we were, if we were asked by Chazal, be like, listen, we got a holiday. We got to like make it work. What are we going to do? And we were sitting on the committee. What part of this story would you focus on? Would you focus on the fact that a bunch of Jews beat the Greeks and basically enabled our survival? Or would you focus on the fact that when they got to the base of Migdash, they went above and beyond. And because of it, God made the oil go longer. Had we lost the war, we'd be dead. Had we lost the war, we'd all be over. Us fighting the Greeks is insane. <coughs> and what if we didn't find the oil? And what if God had to go for one day? What would have happened if God didn't poof the miracle? Why in the world is the symbol of Hanukkah the light? The light. That's, after, that's like, that's after the drama. The, sto- the miracle of the lights is, is pales in comparison to the miracle of the battle. We shouldn't be lighting Hanukkahs on, uh, candles on Hanukkah. We should, be, we should be holding swords, not candles. We shouldn't be, and, and because we're Jews, like, you know how this works, right? Because we're Jews, we don't just, like, do stuff, we eat stuff. So, like, it turns into a whole thing, you know what I'm talking about? Like, you know, not like, you know, I mean, like the oil, you got to eat the oil, so now if you get a latke, it's a mitzvah. If you have a donut, it's a mitzvah. Basically, deep fry anything, all shot. and then there's, like, a special mitzvah, God loves you more, and I'm sure someone's going to say there's an Isham Yusera that used to come on Shabbos that takes all your calories, and now he shows up again on, on Hanukkah and takes all your calories, like, it's a mitzvah, just, just deep fry things, and then you get a mitzvah. Like some, that's, that's, what we should be doing is we shouldn't be like deep frying stuff and like eating. We should be doing push-ups. We should be sword fighting. We should be lighting candles. We should be like raising swords. This is the greatest miracle. This is the greatest military win of all time. This is bigger than the Six Day War. This is bigger than 1948. Why are we obsessed with these candles? So much so, by the way, that's all we do. We, we don't do anything else, if you think about it. Like Hanukkah, like I remember once it's sitting at work and people are like, they, they, they're like, what's with your holiday? Like, you're not going to shul all day? I'm like, no, I'm like, you don't have long meals? I'm like, no, like, not a lot of davening? I'm like, no, like, what goes on in Hanukkah? I'm like, we just like candles. And it's like uncomfortable in the house. You know what I'm like, you like candles, like, and that's it. So if you, you like stretch it up, Baruch Atah because it's one thing. What is it with these candles that make us crazy? That is the essence of this holiday. So I want to share with you a concept. We can build it much longer if we have the time, but let me do it quickly. It's Sunday morning. When God created the world. He did something that was incredible. It was so incredible that it is beyond really the awareness of, of, of human beings. That means that most people, most Jews, Religious Jews can go to shul every day and they'll never think of this. You can have a Jew that 
will spend his whole life touching up against spirituality and never really stop to think about the extent of this. God created the world. In the beginning, he created angels. They all kiss up. That's not fun. Then he created animals, but they don't pay attention. That's not fun. Then he did something that was incredible. So incredible that it's beyond, it's beyond our minds, which is why we don't think about it. God took an animal. Eats, drinks, sleeps, procreates an animal. Raised it on its two feet. Or fashioned it, if you will, from the ground. And breathed a piece of himself in it. When God created mankind, what he did was inside us, inside human, God put a piece of himself, which means that inside me and you, if your eyes are open right now, what is inside us, what powers us, the reason why our eyes are open is that what is generating our essence is not just that our body parts are connected. What's generating who we are is that we are all made with a piece of the divine himself. This is what the Arizal says, a chelek eloka mimal, a piece of God from above. And the Balatanya says, mamish, which means literally, not metaphorically, not interesting. What is that teaching me? It's teaching you that if our eyes are open right now, the, what's in our cells, what generates us every second, is that we are connected to a source that is infinite. That's our essence. That's who we are. And all the time I speak to people and they're like, I'm this observant, I'm that observant, I'm this religious, I'm that religious, I'm this denomination, I'm that denomination. I'm like, stop it. Stop it. You have more spirituality inside you that you'll ever need for the rest of your life. Whether you're inspired or educated, forget that. You have more spirituality inside you than you'll ever need for the rest of your life. You never have to become spiritual. You have to reveal spiritual. That means it means you have a power source inside us that is beyond this world. It means whatever it is that's in front of us pales in comparison to what's within us. And what that means that I can't even imagine what I can become because my brain only works based on the neuroplastic connections that I make based on my experience. And that's only in the past, which means I can't imagine things in the future. And the power source that I have is beyond my imagination. I have no idea who I can be. I have no idea what's possible for me. I have no idea how kind or patient or strong or empathetic or spiritual. I have no idea how much I could become in this world because the source that I go to to become great is beyond my own imagination. And if you're raising a kid, you know this because, you, because when a kid turns to you and you say, why'd you get an, an 85 or a 70 on math? You're like, I can't do math. Ma. You're like, no, what do you mean? You study for two minutes. You can't do math. And the kid tells you, you don't know me. I'm not good. And a parent, you're like, you have no idea who you are. And the kid's like, what do you know? I'm 15. I know everything. And a parent wants to look at a kid and go, no, 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 no. You have no idea your power. And the kid's like, you don't know me, ma. You don't know me, dad. I went to school. They're not friends with me. I'm not good at sports. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. And to a parent, when a kid goes, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, that is like the worst thing they can possibly hear because a parent knows that a kid has no idea who they are. When God looks at us, he goes, let me tell you something. The I can't that comes out of your mouth drives me insane because you have no, I'm your parent. You have no idea who you are. And when we look at life and we try to solve life by trying to figure out who I am by who I was, we miss it because what's inside us is a source that is greater than we can ever imagine. And if you ever need proof of that, look at the state of Israel because nobody in a million years would have thought that a bunch of Jews who mostly came from the world that beat them up can roll into a place, have five enemies and figure out how not to survive, but how to literally kill it in 75 years. Where'd they get that from? The best everything, startups and healthcare and military, where, where? Because they just happen to be smarter. Because God goes, listen to me, 
You have no idea who you are. You come from me. You should keep on fighting. I'll show you. You should keep on fighting. I'll show you. And as soon as a bunch of Jews walked into their state, drew a line in the sand and said, you know what? We ain't going nowhere. We're home. We're never leaving again. You got a problem with us? You want to come fight? We have no airplanes? We'll figure it out. We don't, have, we don't have enough bullets? We'll figure it out. We're always under attack? We'll figure it out. It's only desert? We'll figure it out. And God goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. You're, you're overcoming your challenges? You believe into something more than yourself? Your first prime minister says, whoever doesn't believe in miracles is in a realist? Why don't you watch your power? God's like, just watch. I'm gonna, do, I'm, gonna show what, I'm gonna show you what I can do for this little country. It's called living with something beyond oneself. What it means to be a Jew means that you live your life and you know that what's inside me is greater than I can ever imagine because it's connected to the creator. And all I'm trying to do is plug into the creator. What I learn, what I pray, the midst, everything in my life is just plugging into that source. That's what it means to really be a Jew, in my humble opinion is to recognize that you come from somewhere that's bigger. We got this incredible holiday called Hanukkah. You know, in, in the physical world, we have symbols that represent things that are bigger than that they are. And the symbol for the soul in the physical world is fire. It says, the Pasuk says, Kiner Hashem Nishmas Adam. Because the candle of God is the soul of man. The soul is actually compared to fire. When someone passes away, you light a candle in their memory. When Shabbat comes in, you bring in the holiest day of the week through fire. If you even look at fire, it looks like it doesn't belong. If it wouldn't be held down by a wick, it couldn't survive in this world. Fire is the representative element to the soul. If our symbol would have been swords, you know what would have happened by now? We'd be like, wow, what a great holiday. What a military victory. It was because we were all strong and big, the way our coloring book said so. It's because we knew the mountainous range. It was because we had the guerrilla tactics. You know what we won? Because of our brains and because of our hands. And the rabbi said, "Uh -uh uh-uh, uh-uh. You don't win fights. You don't win battles because of your brains and your hands. When the Maccabees came into the, the, to the base of Mikdash, they weren't just like, let's get back to business. Let's pick the menorah first. In fact, the menorah wasn't even where it was supposed to be. It was melted down. And it, the menorah was in the Heichal. They pulled it out into the Chatzer, into the courtyard, and they rebuilt it. The menorah wasn't just like back to business. The menorah was something that they were showing the world. It was a symbol. Their fighting for pure oil wasn't just because they were being machmir. They were showing the world, don't forget, this is the victory. The victory, this was a battle of soul. The know where the fire represents the soul. We fought because we lived our lives believing in this. They try to snuff that out of us. They try to tell us that we're not connected to God. We believe we were. We fought a battle on that one principle. This menorah isn't just one of the things we're going to do. This is the symbol of the whole battle. We didn't win because of our hands. We won because of our soul. We won because we believe that we're more than just our bodies. We won because we, we won because when we look at challenges, we know the challenge has no shot against us. That's the mentality of a Maccabee. So the rabbis say, you know why you light candles for? And it's all you're going to do. You're not going to go to eat. You're not going to eat. You're not going to go to shul for 10 hours. You're not going to do anything else. You know what you're going to do? You're going to light a candle. You know when you light the candle? You light the candle in the wintertime when it's dark, at night when it's dark, and under 10 tefachim when it's dark. You, we're going to find the holiday, the rabbis say, that's dark and dark and dark, because dark is challenge. The Hanukkah was the last holiday before the exile. 
as my grandmother before she, my, my, my great grandmother knew when they, when the Nazis gathered them, they went, took them to the trains. They knew this would be the last time she would see her daughter. So she took out a, a, a locket from her jewelry box and handed it to my grandmother. And she said, hold on to this. Cause when you hold on to this, you'll remember how much we love you. Remember your family. The last open miracle in our history before exile was the Hanukkah candle. It wasn't just because God was poofing miracles that were irrelevant it's because he was handing us a locket to take with us as we go into the long, dark exile of challenges. And he goes, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to make a holiday called Hanukkah. Hanukkah is dark upon dark upon dark. It's challenging. But remember, when you hit challenges, there's always the Hanukkah candle. You always have your soul. You have spirituality. You have me. You have me inside you. I can help you look inward and fight because you have more inside you than you can dream of. And all I need, God says, is a little oil, just a drop, a little fire, a little belief. I'll go eight more days. I'll go. And eight, by the way, is a symbol of beyond nature. I'll go. God says, listen, you put a little oil in and you search for the purest amount of your oil. I got the rest. That's the real story of Hanukkah. all entering into crazy times. For some more challenging than others. In some cases, we may have been living in winter since last March. But the way a Jew deals with challenge is by going deeper. By going deeper into their own spirituality. By going deeper into their own connection to God. Because we know that just a little bit of light dispels a lot of darkness. And so the story of Hanukkah is a story of our lives. Because all of us in some ways are underdogs. Whether we feel it coming at us from the outside world or we feel it in our potential. Who I am versus who I could become. We're always underdogs. The Jews are always underdogs. And me and you are about to enter into the holiday where we're going to tap into a light that we may miss or we may leverage depending on where our minds are at. And my blessing to all of us is that we don't miss it. Not this year. We don't miss it. And when you light those candles, remember, God doesn't want you to light candles. He wants you to be candles. When we go to that Hanukkah menorah in a couple of days from now, this isn't just like light candles, nail down some donuts and get some presents. There's a lot more going on. When you light those candles, it's about being the essence of who we are. It's about tapping into the same power that my great grandparents tapped into. It's that same source that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that the Israel, the Maccabees, you look, you look up through the chain of great Jews and they all tapped into the same candle. That's the candle that me and you are gonna light. That's the candle that me and you can become. And my bracha is that we should be that candle. We already are that candle to some extent, but we should only be that candle. We should realize that what I got is beyond my mind. So I look at darkness and I don't fall down to darkness. You know what I do when I see darkness? I light it up. That's what I do, because I'm a Maccabee. And with that, maybe just maybe, we'll be able to dispel the darkness in our, in anything around us and bring out our true candle, light ourselves up, light our families up, light our communities up. Let me tell you something before I go. That's why I love your rabbi so much. That's why I love him, because he's always lighting it up. He believes so much in everybody else. He's always got big visions. He's always thinking of more. That's true Jewish greatness. And together, may we have a happy Hanukkah. I hope that God gives us the real presence that we deep down want. And we should be zochet together, I hope, to see a time where we get to see Hanukkah in the actual base of Megdash together. And here be Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, uh, Charlie, for those words. There's a lot to think about. Uh, true inspiration. It's always great to see you. And Mr. Shem will get to see you in person very soon.
I want to remind everyone Thank you. Uh, that uh, these words are dedicated in memory of our dear Caleb Mayer, and that next week, next Hashem, we continue this series uh, with uh, Beatty Deutsch, the uh, famous uh, Jewish marathon runner. She will be joining us for a different kind of talk. That will be next week at 9.30 a.m., talking about uh, Jewish courage, perseverance in the modern-day Maccabee. So join us next Sunday morning, and everybody should have a wonderful week and a Hanukkah Sameach.